This is kind of an odd video to be making because I'm going to talk about the Hotbox 60i that I make right as I'm ending it. Yeah, I'm stopping making it. And I'm not stopping making it because I don't like it or I think anything's wrong with it. Actually, it's my personal favourite of all the attenuators I make. I'm stopping making it because it sells the least out of all of them and because I need the time that's going to free up to do other things, you know, and, and also the resources because keeping attenuators in stock is very expensive because you have to keep all the different ohms and then you have to keep all the different designs. So you might say, hey, I make three attenuator designs. Well, that's going to be nine different pieces of stock, even if we only stock four, eight, and 16. We might stock two as well, but let's ignore twos and below. So that's at least nine different pieces of stock in at least two different locations, because I need them here, so I can send them out on the eBay and website. I need them at Amazon for Prime. So that's 18 different pieces of stock. And obviously we need multiples of each of those. So I have to hold, say, at least three for each location, 72 pieces of stock. That's a huge amount of money to hold 70 plus pieces of stock at all times. And with the current climate, the way it's been and difficulty getting parts, that's been very painful and very difficult for me because often I have to buy parts in bulk, in mass quantities to make sure I have them when I need them. So by getting rid of the least selling hot box and freeing up a third of my inventory and freeing up, uh, instead of holding 72 items or whatever, I'm going to be holding whatever a third less is, 48. I'm going to free up a, a big chunk, 24 sort of items held in stock. And compared to pedals, where there aren't variations, you've just got a pedal, uh, getting rid of one hotbox realistically frees up enough space for two to three pedals. So that's what it's going to be, and it's going to be the one that sells the least. So those are my reasons. And um, maybe one day I'll bring it back. I'd like to bring it back. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why this beautiful little Hotbox 60, it's got no label on it and it's open at the moment. I've got three of them here on the bench and these are probably the last three I'm going to make for a while. I'm going to talk about what makes them special and why I'm sad to see them go. Now, the first and simplest thing is they are the only reactive attenuator I've ever seen for under 100 quid. I have sold these variously at around £69, £79, and yeah, I, I can make a little bit of a profit at £69. I'm currently selling them off at 59 which is ridiculous. And the reason I really like them is their simplicity and robustness. They're probably going to be the longest lasting attenuator I make. I reckon these will still be around after I'm dead. Because when I started out making attenuators, I wasn't 100% sure what I was doing. And so I tended to overbuild everything to be on the safe side. So the main two power resistors that take up the bulk of it are 250 watt resistors. So there's 100 watts of resistor in the main chain for a, for a 60 watt attenuator. That's before we even add the others in and add the other bits in. That's before even some of the power gets sent to the speaker. So they're hugely overrated, uh, which is a good job too, because there's no heatsink. So that derates them a bit, you know, which I knew. But that keeps the box tiny and small. So we've got this lovely small box with very, very high quality parts. And the same with the switches. I, I was, I didn't like, so all these guys with the rotary switches, and I know for a fact that most of those rotaries are only rated for a fraction of an amp, like 0.15 amp is common, 150 milliamps. I mean, in watts, the thing with amps is it depends on the ohms. Ohms plus amps and you work out the watts. But long and short is those switches are probably rated for around three or four watts. That's it. And manufacturers just, well, just ignore that because those 150 milliamps are at mains voltage. So those switches are designed for a high voltage but very, very low current. So they just sort of gloss over it all and say, well, Amplifier watts are quite low voltage and high. We'll just pretend it's fine. It's not fine. It looks awful. It's a terrible, terrible thing to do. And so I went with these chunky toggles, which compared to the 0.15 amp 
are 15 amp. They are 100 times better at switching power. That's absolutely ridiculous. So that's my bypass switch. You know, and I really like that on these. And I, I went through different bypass switches and different ones. So there's so much refinement. I really love the switch in this. And if you haven't guessed so far, this is going to be a long wittering because I'm a little bit sad about letting these go. I'm sad about retiring them. You know, and I want to talk about all the things that went into them. So the first ones I made didn't even have a switch. And then the second ones had a switch. I made the 60 or something it was called. And I put on it Max Power 120 and a few people plugged it into Marshalls and cooked it. And I learned a harsh lesson there, which is never put Max Power on things unless you expect people to actually take that as like, we can run a 120 watts all the time. And I was like, no, no, 60 RMS or whatever. No, it was all wrong. Um, so yeah, I put these lovely resistors in. And you know, there's something funny about using Arcol UK made resistors. They just sound better. Do you know, I have tried to figure that out all the way along. You know, people pick these up, plug them in and say, wow, why does yours sound better? And you know, I'm like, honestly, don't know. Just, but I agree it does. I mean, I've a beat it and I'm like, no, it's clearly, I prefer. All I can assume is like the wire they use inside them, the way they're wound, the composites, that all has an effect, you know, in some way. But they do. So I'm really pleased those resistors. There's another time I've expanded to use different ones. I have the 50 watts, we've got a 25 watt one there, a 10 watt one there. And we've got these little, little green wire wound things as well, which is part of the switching network. So I developed initially one that just had two modes, had high and low. People kept asking for a bypass switch. I didn't like bypass switches. The problem to me is if you've got all the power of your amp going through one of these and you switch it, there's a tiny moment in the middle where the impedances are all wrong. It's a split second. Well, I was worried that could jar through the transformer of the amp, cause some damage, and I'd read that it could. So I went, I was so reluctant. And in the end, I put them in, but I added a, uh, a bypass resistor in it. And this. So this is always on, it's always in line. It's only a very small amount, but I noticed a lot of amp manufacturers do this on their output jacks. They'll put one of these little resistors across the output just in case you pull the speaker lead out. And so I tested it on my own amplifier without a speaker lead and I literally pulled the speaker aid out. I started playing music through with no speaker and went around testing it to see what was happening. And it wasn't great for the amp, the amp wasn't happy, but it wasn't hurting. I thought, well, that's the way. So we have one of those that makes the bypass safe. So that was an evolution. And I decided that I didn't need a mega toggle for this power switch, which gave which I could just fit in. And, you know, and a lot of the time when you're designing things like this, it's about fitting things in. Really, your design is limited by what parts you can find. You know, if you can find a really cool small switch, then bam, you've got a new product. And so these little switches were two and a half amp. And I was like, well, this is the main one, so it's already dropped one level. So by the time we hit the small switch, two and a half amp is loads, you know, and we're still well over 10 times those horrible rotary switches. Happy. Wire in it, heat proof wire, that was a chore to find. Uh, I'm giving away some of my secrets here, but immersion heater wire. Immersion heater wire is rated to 100 degrees C or so, you know, and it's cheap. So I buy immersion heater wire and I strip all five cores, and that's why. You'll open them and you'll find blue, brown, green, the usual ones, and you'll find black and gray. It's a version here, why? Secret given away. But the real, <clears throat> the real magic, I think, that took this up to the final level, because the first version had no switch at all. The second version actually had a speaker out, a, a, a line out on it, but it was a lot of effort for something people weren't really using. Then the next version, the Pro, had a high low switch and then the pro something I don't remember what I called it the next one up had a high low switch and a bypass and then eventually I got to thinking could I make it reactive you know and you can see here this this chunky ass coil in the middle and I, I bought these coils well, I found rather you know again a lot of products are about what you can find out there and I, I came across this really nice coil I could get from this little supplier and it was dead expensive and I rang them up and they made them for me and then they wouldn't answer my phone calls after a while because they didn't like making five at a time, whatever. A little British company. Really, do you know, I get angry about that one to this day. Do you know, they looked so professional and I just think, 
this is this is what's wrong a lot of the time with business. They whine and they moan. Oh, the world is so hard when making money, and then they don't answer your phone calls. I'm literally sat here, and I have no idea how many of these I've made. I've ordered by now, but they weren't from that company. That first company, I got. And those first calls are in the early hot boxes. You'll find a different coil. They look different. They're chunkier and a different shape. Sent me like five. Then they sent me like ten. And then they're just like, oh, not your answer is emails. Not your answer is calls. Just rude. Just rude. And I think I think I got to place an order with them in the end, and they just cancelled it. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Never did really know why. What an absolute bunch of hills. Anyway. I started looking around, I found a little company in Denmark, well they were in Denmark, they've moved actually, um, who made even nicer looking coils and their specification was fantastic. Um, but I couldn't really find anywhere easy to buy them and I was worried about suppliers, so I just rang them. I rang this massive mega company up and they, they made, I think they made coils for Bang & Olufsen. Yeah, and a bunch of other really, and I rang them up and they said, you're an OEM, you make your own equipment, that's good enough for us. Minimum order? No, nope, we don't do a minimum order. You can order one if you want. And I was like, really? And I ordered from this huge made company who deals directly with OEMs, I original equipment manufacturers like myself, people who make rather than sellers. And they were honestly, to this day, they're fantastic. The prices are still better than anyone else. Um, they moved from Denmark for economic reasons uh, into somewhere else in Europe. Um, yeah, you know, I can specify what I want. And this this is this is one of their conductor coils. And this is the heart of a reactive unit, is very simply a coil of wire. But what's really important is you know how precise you probably can't really see it, it's hard to tell there. Go on, focus on it. Try if I screw my face a bit, it might decide it's okay, yeah. You see that is how tightly put together those coils are, how precisely lined up they are how well wound onto the former they are, what the former material's made of. It can't be any old junk. It really changes the sound. And there's so many factors that go into these. They're such a really chaotic piece of technology. You know, when you buy a capacitor, it's a capacitor. You buy a resistor, it's a resistor. And you will get strange window lickers comparing the differences between the two. But the reality is, is there's, there's, if there's any difference at all, it's incredibly small between one capacitor and the next. I mean, it's minuscule, it's tiny, but when you come to an inductor, honestly, you can wind, I can get two off a batch, they, they, they vary even and the batches are little, you know, and, and from one manufacturer to another, whopping. In fact, you know that if you place it near the aluminium, the inductance reduces, it becomes damped and uh, sort of sweeter sounding bright sounding and if you place it in a steel the opposite happens and it actually gains inductance becomes darker sounding and dirtier so the distance you place it from the metal chassis and this this is this is why it's hovering in the middle yeah so yeah a lot, a lot of love went into these and the wiring on it um the, the bent metal wires this is sort of the evolution of that as well I'm building a whole machine to cut them so yeah that that's my that's my thing. I really, I really love these. I'm really passionate about them. I hope one day I bring them back. I might, if I get bored, make some more. At some point, bored, me bored, like I ever have time to be bored. Uh, make some more because I accidentally bought like 60 of these just before I decided to call it quits. So I've got a cupboard full of inductors, you know, and that's the heart and soul of it. In fact, the cupboard full of inductors are slightly different values because people were telling me these were too dark. Um, slightly too dark, some people say, no, a bit warm. So I may have changed the values and then just a little bit less warm, a little more mid-range. <laughs> so there'd be a slightly different generation if I relaunched them. Um, well, yeah, I mean, apart from the technical details, the so other thing I loved about these is that they're just simple, you know, high-low bypass modes. And for most purposes, I think for nine out of 10 purposes, these are great. You just plug them in your amp, leave them on, forget them. They sound good. That's it. You know, I think that's what you really want in an attenuator, but the reality is the ones with the volume control have fine-grained controls that you play at night, sell more. Obviously, that's what people need. It's the function that most people are buying attenuators so they can play their amp loud 
in really quiet scenarios that that seems to be the gist of it whereas merely quiet doesn't quite cut it so yeah there we go that's my hotbox 60i 2022 edition the last of the line i say i've only got maybe a, not even a dozen of them left i reckon because they've been selling like crazy because i've dropped the price 59 quid i mean where do you get re reactive attenuated for 59 quid let alone one built to uh these kind of hand-wired point-to-points you know standard but uh there we go bye bye attenuator you know going out the window so you can do other stuff for a bit possibly forever maybe not we'll see you know i think but i think uh you know hard choices onward onward and uh i'm going to move on to the grand classic distortion which i'm launching on kickstarter tomorrow and work on that now I'm gonna, well i'm gonna close these up put stickers on them put them in boxes and these uh last three put this last inductor in this one and yeah bye bye